In 1930, a painter from Iowa by the name of Grant Wood painted this. You've probably seen this painting before, or at least a parody of it. Depicted in the work are two rural figures, a father with a pitchfork and his daughter. The title of the painting is American Gothic. When I was little, I had family who lived in Missouri. I'm a Colorado man, so Missouri isn't too far away from me. In fact, it's close enough, 772 miles to be specific, that it doesn't really require a flight to get there if you've got a free day on your hands. What that meant was that whenever my parents chose to bring us out to that section of our family, we'd get there by driving. It would take about 12 hours in total, and the majority of the drive would be through Kansas. Driving through the entire state of Kansas is a uniquely mind-altering experience. I hope it won't offend any of my Kansas-based subscribers to say that there isn't a lot to the state, at least not the parts we were driving through. There's nothing around to see for what seems like forever but fields of dry grass and the occasional cornfield. As mentioned earlier, I've lived the majority of my life in Colorado, where the horizon is broken by the Rocky Mountains. Mountains and hills surround you no matter where you go in Colorado. In fact, looking out the living room window of my apartment, I've got a beautiful view of the Boulder Flatirons. So, to encounter the empty gray horizon of a Kansas interstate with nothing but drifting clouds and the occasional bird lazily floating through the air is eerily disquieting. There's a dark emptiness to the scene, a microcosm of Americana which is reminiscent of the early days of our nation's development, when what laid past the horizon was still partially unknown. There is an intense quality to Wood's painting. A brown smogginess in the air, a dustiness to the house, a severity on the face of the woman, a fourth wall-breaking stare from the man, I can't help but feel that something terrible is hidden behind the scene, just out of sight. In a conversation with my girlfriend, an art student and painting aficionado, she pointed out how the color of the piece works to bring all your attention to these strange figures, how the architecture and the skyline is all depicted in lighter shades, and that the darkest shades in the painting appear on the two standing before us, in their clothes and maybe even in their eyes. Wood painted American Gothic after seeing a similar farmhouse in his home state of Iowa. The depiction here is of the people Wood thought might live in a house like this one, which I should note is built in the Gothic carpenter style. Is that not extra unsettling? As noted earlier, Wood was an Iowa native, which means that from my perspective, he was extra qualified to make assumptions about the characters who might inhabit a place like the one he saw that day in 1930. The eeriness of it all, the strange darkness to the scene, and the mystery on the canvas is a mystery found deep in the hearts of every person who spends time in this country. On long drives across states, like the ones I was taking to Missouri, one can't help but to find themselves considering the uneasiness settling in their stomachs. My mood sours with every Bible Belt billboard I see, each of them promising me I'm going to hell for one sin or another. I darken with each ocean of corn or weed or whatever else that we sail past, with every adjustment I have to make against the gusting winds which threaten to blow me off the road. In this stretch of the nation, I become a more weary version of myself. How is it that Wood was able to so uniquely capture a dark facet of Iowa culture? How is it that I am so quickly able to identify the bleakness of the Midwestern interstate? Well, it's because despite being a self-proclaimed Colorado man, I was born in Missouri, just like how Wood was born in Iowa. Obviously, there's a difference between the technical skill required to create a haunting painting and the semi-poetic crazy person I required to make my dorky essays, but the through line is that both of us are deeply familiar with the setting of the darkness. We lived there. I am not a professional. I am not a horror or writing expert. But I am an American. He sees you all alone. He sees your weakness shown. When you are falling apart. Susceptibility is all he needs to see. So he can poison your heart. You might try a substance, take away your blues, better watch out. Mm -hmm. He will see it's his chance, send you off to hell, there is no doubt. I've been playing a lot of American Truck Simulator recently because I'm turning into a 40 year old dad. It's one of those games that has essentially no story, just a bunch of available jobs and upgrades and routes for you to access at your own leisure. 
When you're on the virtual road, the majority of your gameplay is a one-to-one -one recreation of the sensation of driving across state highways. It's fun for a person like me who doesn't have a car but enjoys the sensation of driving, but it can also get a little repetitive. The design of the setting is great. Each of the states is immediately recognizable, and clearly a lot of thought has been put into making things like traffic, the road, the weight of your truck, the controls necessary to turn, and a bunch of other little things as accurate to real-world long-distance driving as possible. But here's the thing. Real-world long-distance driving can get kinda boring. Obviously, I'm not doing actual 16-hour drives, but even on the shorter trips, eventually, you need something to occupy your mind. That's how I had the genius idea to start listening to not one, but two different podcasts while playing. The first is called The Left-Right Game by Qcode, and the other is Alice Isn't Dead by the same creators who brought us the insanely popular show Welcome to Night Vale. If you've listened to either of these podcasts, you know how appropriate both of them are for the context of American Truck Simulator. Both of these fiction podcasts have a lot to do with the experience of driving in America for a long time, quite like the experience I laid out in the intro to this video, or the experience anyone might have playing American Truck Simulator, not to mention driving in reality. Without context, that might sound pretty boring, but if you believe that, clearly you haven't spent much time with Midwestern gothics. Familiarity and horror are two sides of the same coin. The abstract can be unsettling, but it will always be our connection to a concept that allows that concept to be elevated to a new horrifying position. Case in point, Europeans often receive a sort of culture shock when coming to the US because, despite how often Americans love to scream about it, they're never really aware of how big the nation is until they're in it. Quite like how Victorian horror in America is founded on an idea we're not quite fully attached to culturally, that being the reign of Queen Victoria and its effects, certain aspects of American horror, the terror of long roll stretches of road with ominous billboards and an unshakable sense that you're being followed, might be unfamiliar to Europeans. Is this to imply that Europe doesn't have any highways? Yes. I mean, no. Uh, Europe definitely has highways, they call them motorways, but the difference is that when you drive for 10 hours in Europe, you'll almost certainly end up in another country. But in the time that it would take for me to drive from Denver to St. Louis or Colorado to Missouri for my non-Americans, I could drive from England to France or from France to Germany. A person in Hungary could drive six hours in any direction and would likely end up in somewhere like Austria or Romania, but a person from Texas could drive for six hours and still be in Texas. The point is, America is shockingly huge, and we know it, and further, it knows it. It should come as no surprise that many people see America as having a sort of personality. Homelands often receive a kind of identity from their residents, especially when those residents are far from home. There is an undeniable hunger to America. Driving on the long, empty roads of the US, especially at night, one might begin to get the sense that they've been swallowed whole by the country, and no matter where they drive now, they will never be able to emerge. This is a big part of the subgenre people like to refer to as Midwestern Gothic. It, of course, specifically is in reference to the Midwest region of America. Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, Nebraska, North Dakota, Ohio, South Dakota, and Wisconsin. All those places that people tend to be more used to passing through or visiting rather than settling in long term. The places without coasts, filled with farmland and miles and miles of empty space. The American personality is strong here. The eerie gaze of a scarecrow shifting in the wind in just enough of a way that it looks like it's watching you pass. The strange car following behind you just far enough away that you can't see the driver. These eerie occurrences that are not so obtrusive to be classified as paranormal, but strange enough that they stand out in your mind, encapsulate the atmosphere of the Midwest. So these two podcasts, Left Right Game and Alice, they both utilize that feeling to create their moments of horror. If you aren't familiar with the concept of the left-right game, it's essentially an exploration of a fictional urban legend originally written by Jack Anderson for the r slash no sleep subreddit, which he later produced in partnership with Q Code Studios. Urban legends are a vital section of American culture. They're what help paint this place as more than a collection of states all arguing with each other, as a place of mystery and intrigue. The premise of the titular game is simple. By taking a consecutive series of left and right turns while driving on just about any American road, one can access a similar but separate dimension, a dimension full of disturbingly familiar entities who pursue you with trucks and cars endlessly. Do you ever look at a huge stretch of road and wonder how something so massive could have been built? I mentioned in my Liminal Spaces essay the intentionality of man-made spaces and how strange it feels to be in one with no real purpose. Somehow, that feeling begins to appear on long stretches of highway. Of course, we know why highways exist, and we know vaguely how they were made. 
In the 50s, Eisenhower started focusing on funding the U.S. interstate highway system, and by the 90s, about 45,000 miles of road had been created. And yet, there's something almost, say it with me, liminal about the U.S. interstate highway system. It just goes on and on, to such a degree that it feels more like an illusion than a physical creation. An illusion, or an infection. As highways began to fill the Midwest, a new conversation began to emerge with them. Is it even worth it? And to simply say yes or no was to ignore components of both sides of the argument. The creation of the IHS also came with the creation of many jobs. For the next projected 35 years, there was always work to be done in the disconnected parts of America, ostensibly connecting them one day at a time. Workers would work in shifts, 24 hours a day, six days a week. Over time, the creation of these interstates would allow people to travel and transport in a way they'd never been able to before, cutting significant time from their journeys. But at the same time, highways began to eat up more and more of the land, covering a once beautiful landscape with artificial markings. The current state of the highway system in America is rife with constant construction, terrible accidents, and a growing form of pollution that still hasn't been dealt with effectively. Because of these two mixed qualities, highways have taken on a strange position in the American zeitgeist, playing an important role in transportation while corrupting the natural landscape. For this reason, we feel equally the alluring pull to get lost in the sensation of driving down these long stretches of asphalt, and the disquieting sensation that we are in a place we are not meant to be. That's why the left-right game is so effective. After passing through the tunnel, which marks the doorway between realities, the characters in the podcast are not greeted with a strange alien planet filled with monsters and magic immediately. No, instead, this alternate reality just appears as more of the same. A long stretch of empty road with a few strange characters along the way, but it isn't until much later that they encounter any real danger. The left-right game is interesting because it paints our roads as something more than themselves. Sure, they may have been built by men some time ago, but so was every haunted house or abandoned asylum. Whatever hand we have in the original construction of these things, the fact is, what they become is always outside of our control. By the very rules of the game itself, the implication is made that for there to even be a connection to another world, a road is required. And because a road is required, there must be something intrinsically supernatural about them. Alice Isn't Dead touches on this perfectly. The differences between Alice and Left Right are easy to recognize, but what those differences accomplish might hide slightly beneath the surface of the format. See, the main character in Alice Isn't Dead, Keisha, isn't seeking out another world like the main character of Left Right. Keisha's seeking out Alice. Now, this might confuse some people because the main character of the Left Right game is also named Alice, but don't worry, they're two different Alices. Ally. The one Keisha is looking for is her wife. Let's go lesbians. Really, all I'm trying to stress here is that while Left Right is about the road taking you to another dimension, Alice is about the road right here. No extra dimension required. In Alice Isn't Dead, the protagonist is a long-haul trucker, which makes things extra fun to listen to while playing American Truck Simulator. While Left Right Game succeeds in warping the setting of the road to be in another universe, Alice Isn't Dead decides to paint our universe as strange and dark. There are these creatures called the Thistle Men. They're described as vaguely human, but there's an obvious sinister tone to their existence. In fact, the first time we're introduced to one in the show, it very quickly illustrates its power by killing a person right in front of the protagonist. The appearance of the Thistle Man is reminiscent of a modern rural man, the very man you might meet in any roadside diner or gas station, complete with a trucker hat and accent, but there are other elements to his appearance, like skin that looks like it doesn't fit, and teeth which sit in its head at impossible angles. The Thistle Men are tormentors of the road, creatures of strange origin who take pleasure in the suffering and pain of those who are foolish enough to cross their paths. There's an element to the behavior and style of speaking of the Thistleman that seems to reference a different and more familiar form of horror than just the fear of death or pain. The protagonist of Alice Isn't Dead is a queer person of color, a combination of traits which can become kind of dangerous depending on where you are and who you're with. In several scenes throughout the show, the Thistlemen are shown to A, take great pleasure in causing pain and discomfort in a person weaker than them, and B, have a connection to the police which allows them to operate with complete immunity. They are a breed of monsters who prey on the weak with the approval of the cops. One can't help but consider the intolerance which is still prevalent in certain locations in America and see this as a criticism of it. I've casually joked about the police before in another video of mine, and unsurprisingly, a portion of the comments on that video were upset that I had done that. To those people, I just have to say one thing. Uh, deal with it. This is my channel, and on my channel, we're critical of powerful institutions who are known for abusing their power. 
Don't get me wrong, there are good cops. I know good cops, but we're not talking about good cops here. In fact, we're talking about some of the worst. The origin of the modern day police in America is, according to Time Magazine, The New Yorker, the NAACP, the American Bar Association, and several other reputable sources, the Slave Patrol. There are other elements to the formation of the institution as it stands today, but in the early 1700s, mainly in the South, the Slave Patrol was responsible for keeping slaves in check, catching runaways, calling riots, and doing any number of other things to keep the enslaved population where it was. After the Civil War, during the ensuing civil rights movements, the same policing force was used to oppress the black population as they fought for civil rights. The kinds of men who sent dogs into protests, that sprayed innocent men and women with powerful fire hoses, all were defending the same things their predecessors in the slave patrol had defended. As times changed in America and the Vietnam War began, the policing of uprisings began to have to do less with race and more with political affiliation. It was the protesters of the war who were now receiving the brunt of the punishment, and for a period, the police didn't seem to be a purely anti-African American institution anymore. And yet, it still was mostly founded on the destruction of free speech and protest. Cut to the modern era, and of course a major section of the population now sees the police force as a racist institution again, as tragedy after tragedy occurs with seemingly very little done to change it. Another specific section of the population seems hugely devoted to defending the institution of the police, a section of the population who is pretty good at letting everyone around them know their opinions. We've all seen a thin blue line flag on the back window of a pickup truck driving down the highway before, or heard the cry of all lives matter at a protest which is very much focusing on the protection of a very specific kind of life. And this timeline, this crucial understanding of the origins of police brutality and injustice, is something which the Midwestern Gothic, and of course Alice Isn't Dead, utilizes as a source of horror. In an early part of the show, Keisha finds a thistle man in the back of her truck. When she goes to investigate, she's attacked and barely able to escape, running to a police officer for help. The police officer ignores her pleas for safety, greets the thistle man easily, and even goes so far as to imply that Keisha wouldn't have been attacked had she not been asking the wrong questions. To reframe this, a young queer female person of color was attacked in her own property, and when seeking out help, she was ignored and essentially told she was asking for it. Huh. If you think I'm honing in on this fact to make a point, you're only half right. My girlfriend is Afro-Latina, and very aware of this side of reality in a way that makes me partially aware of it. Of course, not to the degree that she is. I may have my issues with the police, but I'm not bringing it up just to bring it up. In fact, a lot of American Gothic horror includes a form of corrupt law enforcement. One of my favorite movies of 2020 was a movie called The Devil All the Time, a movie which takes place mostly in Ohio and West Virginia, allowing us a smooth transition from the grumble of Midwestern Gothic into the twang of Southern Gothic. It's a movie with a killer cast, most notably Tom Holland doing a pretty good West Virginia accent. It's the best present I ever got, thank you. Near the end of the movie, while returning home under not great circumstances, Tom's character, Arvin, is almost killed by a corrupt police officer trying to hide the immoral actions of his sister and her husband, who had been killing hitchhikers in the area for years. The Devil All the Time is about the depravity which sneaks its way into small communities, and how that depravity undoes those communities. Everything that you'd expect to encounter in the South is present. A strong religious overtone, a deep patriotism, a focus on community and presentation. None of these things are evil by themselves. In fact, they're all deeply positive things. Religion is beautiful at its best, patriotism inspiring, community important, but the way Southern Gothics tend to work is by taking these familiar things, just as mentioned earlier, and introducing them to a darkness that might have been there to begin with, just under the surface. The new preacher in the story is a man who's awfully good at speaking righteously, like the megachurch pastors of the modern era, but he uses the power his words give him to seduce and take advantage of young women, who he feels no responsibility for when what you'd expect to happen happens. The patriotism and circumstances which inspire a man, Arvin's father specifically, to enlist in the military during World War II ends up giving him such intense PTSD and depression that after his wife gets cancer, he insanely kills and crucifies his son's dog to make her better. When that obviously doesn't work, he ends his own life, starting a cycle of depravity and violence in the small town that won't end for another decade or so. It is the community of the South that makes people feel so comfortable with each other, and it is that comfort which allows the worst of the bunch to prey on the best.
West Virginia is a prime location for Southern Gothics, where church bells are more ominous than anywhere else, but it's not just the people of West Virginia who we need to be careful of. There are legends of things in the night far stranger and more dangerous than any horrible preacher or crazy cop. One of the most popular and well-known cryptids of all time is the Mothman of Point Pleasant, West Virginia. I'm gonna say it now just to get it out of the way, I fucking love the Mothman. He's both goofy and terrifying at the same time, and I think a lot of the community specifically agrees with me. The Mothman is well known for being a sort of omen of destruction. Every time there's a disaster of any scale, from the collapse of a local bridge to the actual attacks on 9-11, there are people who claim to have seen the Mothman around the area. Witnessing the Mothman is like getting a vision from the future. In the Adventure Zone, Amnesty, a live play podcast started by the McElroys whose specific season setting was indeed West Virginia, the Mothman is a beloved character who hides as a human named Injured Colt. I didn't know this before researching, but Injured Colt is the name of another West Virginian cryptid, a smiling humanoid figure of unknown origin. It seems that cryptids are hugely relevant to a certain portion of America. Bigfoot, Mothman, the Goatman, the Dogman. Little note. If you want to come up with a cryptid who will be remembered forever, apparently the formula is just to find an animal and attach the word man to the end. Of course, one of my other favorite cryptids doesn't fit so smoothly into this box. I feel a little odd talking about the Wendigo, mostly because there's a whole ass man named Wendigoon who's wildly more qualified to dive into such a topic. The Wendigo is a Native American urban legend about a cannibalistic monster who feeds on other men. When I first learned about the Wendigo, I learned about it as a literal entity, one to be feared and avoided, but over time, it's become more and more clear to me that the Wendigo exists as more of a metaphor than anything else. Associated with the cold and the hunger of winter, the original story of the Wendigo was meant to ward off the urges of greed and violence that occurred under the harsh circumstances of the colder months, the urges to worry only about yourself and not the well-being of your community. In the modern age, the legend still exists, but there are few who truly believe in its existence. Those infected by the Wendigo aren't bloodthirsty monsters, not openly at least. They're the needlessly wealthy, the irresponsibly powerful, the thoughtlessly violent. They're men, cannibalized by their own greed, consumed by ambition, and unaware or uncaring of the destruction they carry with them. The style of legend isn't an uncommon one, especially within the Native American population. Stephen Graham Jones's The Only Good Indians is another story rooted deeply in Native American culture about the consequences of greed. The title of the book is a reference to the phrase, the only good Indians are dead Indians, which was popularized by President Theodore Roosevelt in an 1886 speech made in New York. I don't go so far as to think that the only good Indians are the dead Indians, but I believe nine out of every ten are, and I shouldn't like to inquire too closely into the case of the tenth. <sighs> Thanks, Teddy. Not to belabor a point, but the horror of existing in America as a minority is a very different horror than what I tend to talk about on my channel. It's not a fun horror or form of creepy escapism. It's a history written in one's own blood. I can't imagine what darkness America has painted into the people whose ancestors lived here before anyone else, who watched their beautiful country transform to fit the vision of a group they didn't understand, a group who killed and stole without mercy, a group who believed that the only good Indian The reason the book makes this illusion with its title is because the majority of the book's plot is about an elk-like monster systematically killing a group of Native American men who had wronged it much earlier in its existence. While hunting in a part of the wilderness which they were not allowed to be in, the members of the group accidentally shot a pregnant elk, who managed to survive on pure willpower for a number of minutes longer before finally being put down. It is the spirit of that elk, furious at the ending of it and its future offspring's life, that hunts down each of the members of this party and brings death to them, each time in a different and unexpected way. The book talks a lot about the culture of Native Americans from both the outside perspective and the inside. Stephen Graham Jones actually lives in the same city as me, and in fact, when I worked in the local bookstore, he came in to talk about his new book, Earth Divers. Stephen Graham Jones is a Blackfeet Native American, and his work is always connected in some way to the Native American experience and Appalachia. Appalachia is another little piece of Americana that I want to talk about, but I actually won't get into it because my hope is to make a video about the subject at some point down the line. Of the many environments in America, from the mountains to the flatlands, from coast to coast, no setting is more ominous or mysterious than the deep woods of the Appalachian Mountains. It's a combination of the Midwestern highway feel of a place that just goes on forever and the Southern rustic feel, an acoustic nightmare. Cryptids, disappearances, shadows, and shapes with no explanation, they're all present in the woods. 
But the woods don't just exist in Appalachia. The final subject of today's video, a little thing we like to call New England Gothic, is also chock full of mysterious trees, much like the Edelwood. In Cartoon Network's Over the Garden Wall, two young boys who don't know better venture into a strange place called the Unknown. It's a deep, dark forest filled with oily Edelwood trees, fairy tale-esque creatures and monsters, and a terrible entity known as the Beast. New England Gothic has ties to a very specific portion of American fear, namely the puritanical kind. It makes sense considering the region. Salem, Massachusetts, a city well known for a weird thing they did one time, is included under the umbrella of New England Gothic. Many stories from this genre have the devil as the antagonist, or an entity quite similar to the devil. The beast from over the garden wall isn't quite the devil, but his behavior is pretty similar. He manipulates people into doing his bidding through guilt, threats, and outright lies, seems only motivated by maliciousness, and shrouds himself in darkness, all traits which the early settlers of New England were terrified of. In fact, in many biblical works, the devil is referred to as the beast. That New English terror also finds a way to appear in Over the Garden Wall, as an old man in a big house begins seeing ghosts where there are none. There is an explanation, of course, but the real horror of the episode is our introduction to a character who can't trust their own mind, and therefore, a character who we can't trust. The mind is the scariest thing, but it's the things around you which act as the ignition for that terror. Shirley Jackson's The Haunting of Hill House makes very clear the source of the strangeness from the beginning of its story. All the characters know they are heading to a supposedly haunted house in the beginning of the tale, but it isn't until they actually see it that a thick and unending dread begins to settle over each of their psyches. In Mike Flanagan's reimagining, which modernizes the plot and characters, it is still wholly and entirely the house which is at fault for the terror its inhabitants experience. It's a uniquely effective kind of manipulation, an almost devilish one, because once again it's a kind of terror that makes whoever experiences it doubt their own sanity. And as that doubt builds up, with no way to relieve it, frustration manifests and grows, and before you know it, everyone is at each other's throats. Paranoia plays a rich part in New England Gothic literature, namely because the Puritan lifestyle was always deeply unforgiving to religious transgression. Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter or Lovecraft's The Shadow Over Innsmouth are both prime examples of exactly the paranoia I'm talking about. Both of these stories are about removed communities who develop a deep and unrelenting mistrust of the protagonist, and that mistrust turns violent or cruel. Robert Eager's The Witch, or The Vavitch as I like to call it, literally refers to itself as a New England folktale, probably because it takes place in New England. The very introduction and premise of the film has to do with one family's separation from one of these larger communities over religious differences, though what exactly these differences were is still up for debate. That separation does nothing to ease the family's struggles, though, as when unknown forces, likely the devil, begin interacting with the family, they all quickly turn on each other. There's something about being separated from the rest of reality that changes a person. Whether it's the solitude of the wilderness, the hypnotic drone of the highway, the creaking sounds of a house which shouldn't be making noise, or the muggy twang of a small southern town, America is too big to always be the same, and much too big not to get lost every once in a while. Americans are a strange breed, but it's because when you come from a place this big, there's no guarantee that the horror you're dealing with is the same as your neighbors. And that's why empathy is so important, now more than ever. It's a big, scary country out there, one stuck in an even bigger and even scarier world. I originally thought about making this video just about the Midwest, but I realized that if we can't share our fears with each other, we'll never beat them. America can be a dark place. There's no reason to make it darker. Howdy, folks. If you made it to the end of this video, I just have to say thank you so much for watching. Me and everyone who works on these videos puts a lot of effort into them, and so the fact that you took the time out of your day to watch it really means a lot to me. Um, I have three shout outs today, and I'll just try to get through them quickly so this video can end. The first is going to be for the editor of this video, Joe. Uh, you can find him at uh, Who Edit Joe on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it. Um, he did a great job. He also made the thumbnail for this video, so uh, man of many talents. And I will be working with him again in the future. So um, thank you so much, Joe. You fucking killed it with the editing for this video. I'm really excited about it. My second shout out is going to be Sarcastic Scribbles on Instagram. Uh, if you didn't see the post that I made about it recently. Uh, she is a Magnus Archives uh, fan artist, um, 
recently who actually was noticed by the majority of uh, the community or the creators of Magnus Archives. She actually was the one who designed my channel thumbnail. If you saw that and you liked it, um, she's uh, the one that you have to thank. And if you're interested in getting a commission, she does them all the time. Um, and you can, you can and should go check her out on Instagram, Sarcastic Scribbles. Our final shout out today is gonna go to Ren on Discord. We have a second member in our channel Discord now, uh, and I got to talk to them a little bit and see some of their art, and it was really cool. So if you're interested in joining the Discord, all you need to do is become a member of the channel. It's not that expensive, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty good at talking to people on the Discord. So if you're interested in communicating with me, sharing ideas, collaborating on something, sharing art, whatever, that's a great place to do it. Thank you again for watching. It really means a lot to me, and I will see you guys in the next video. Thank you so much. Bye! Wendigan.